And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple, a, a man who makes time zones my personal nemesis, <laughs> A man who we previously had on in the early days of this of this series, talking about gods and monsters, and now bringing in um, stingers and spores. The one, the one and only J. C. Thompson. How are you doing tonight, man? Or today, in your case? I hope I didn't. I hope I didn't blow out my mic. Yeah, it's making some interesting noises over here from time to time. Ah. So, so I I know it's been quite, I know it's been quite a few months since I since I had you in the hallowed halls of the temple. How have you been holding up? I've been doing pretty good. Uh, let's see. Um, I got Gods and Masters uh, out. Uh, finished all the stretch goal products for it. I chilled for about three months, just, you know, let my brain vegetate and recover. And, uh, then I started writing some new stuff. Mm -hmm. So when I, when I looked at, um, st when I looked at stingers and spores, I did, I did come to realize that this is something that, um, definitely has, a, definitely has a lot of potential and I'm not just, and I'm not just going with the obvious stuff with say a bug's life, but when you consider all the crazy animals in the, in the animal kingdom and, how some of them served as inspiration for monsters in um in got in God knows how many artworks um the whole thing makes a makes a lot more sense I was honestly kind of surprised uh when I when I first kind of got this idea I started googling around to see you know has this been done before and then when I realized that uh at least on a TTRPG standpoint, it, it hasn't really been done as far as I've been able to find. I was quite surprised. Uh, I think the big reason for that is just because um, there's just so much stuff out there. There's so much source material. There are so many different types of uh, insects. And uh, honestly, a, a lot of it is just plain weird. It, it would be difficult to, uh, to handle if you have the wrong rule system, trying to replicate it. And, well, the, f well, the first... Well, the first thing is that I is that if I were to even see someone trying to attempt this kind of thing with a class based rule system, my brain just stops, just jumps out of my yeah, head, it absolutely will not work, and, and says, "Nope, I'm not doing that. You do this." Yeah, it just couldn't be done. Uh, mm -hmm. There are very few systems that could handle it. Uh, you know, obviously, Savage Worlds is my medium of choice. Uh, I think you could do it all right with Powered by the Apocalypse. Uh, and if you wanted to, you know, just keep it from a story standpoint, you could probably do it with Fate. Uh, but D20, I think, could not handle it. Or at least it would be a very uh, pared down version. You wouldn't have, you know, nearly the same variety of characters and concepts that you can have with a uh, more open-ended system. And I know some people would would argue that it could be done with OSR. I'm I'm not convinced it could be done with that either. Like that's why I said any. That's why I um, wasn't specific with what D20 wouldn't work with this. Any of them wouldn't work because you still have that big you still have that big elephant in the room regard regarding the sheer variety of the insect kingdom. So mm -hmm. if so if you're go. So um, you'd either ha you'd have to you'd have to account for that as mu as much as you could, and there's no way you can account for that in a book that's going to be on some level of concise. Yeah, it would be an encyclopedia, effectively. And if I want if I wanted to pick up an encyclopedia, I'd probably just use Hero System. <laughs> yeah, fair to say. Um. I don't. Ha For the record, I don't hate Hero System. I just, I just like picking on the giantness of the book and the fact that its character creation book is one of the largest ones on my shelf. How long does it take you to make a character in Hero System? Mm, if I was doing a, if I was doing a speed challenge, and I d and I didn't have Hero Designer accessible to me, yeah, probably an hour. 
45 minutes mm. if I can do it quick. Mm. And if you're doing it around a table with a bunch of players, that's going to be that's going to be an, that's going to be an evening. Um, yeah, it's about as it's about as bad as as doing a character for a role master. Mm. Um, but what? But given that, what what kind of sparked the idea of doing this kind of thing? Aside from it being something that nobody had really that nobody's really done a whole lot. Well, uh, I live in Taiwan. Uh, first off, there's a lot of weird bugs around here if you uh, go outside. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, we, we probably have a bit more bi- biodiversity than you're used to in Minnesota. Uh, last year, I was... Um, uh, I do airsoft uh, also. Last year, I was uh, running through the jungle and stopped short right in front of a, a spider about the size of my hand, just hanging at face level. I very nearly ran into that thing, and uh, it had a bunch of little spiders on the outside. I'd say like five or six of them that were all about, oh, I don't know, dime-sized. Mm-hmm. And just for pure curiosity, I decided to you know see what that was. I just Googled it, and uh, as it turned out, it was a giant female uh, a golden orb weaver, and uh, the small ones are not the babies. They're her husband's. Uh, basically the males and that kind of gave me an idea of like that's sort of like almost a reverse of dracula you know dracula is the uh, the big blood sucker who you know hangs out in the high place just waiting for hapless victims to you know stumble across his lair and he has his uh you know wives on the side well this is sort of the uh the reverse so i started thinking you know how, how can i apply that sort of logic to a setting uh i played the heck out of uh, a bunch of um uh like bug uh video games uh hollow knight i played uh bug fables if you've heard of it it's mm-hmm. like a um paper mario clone essentially it's very good um and yeah, watched heard. some uh, movies i mean obviously there's like ants uh a bug's life and there's actually like i, I would even call it like a subgenre of kids cartoons that all kind of delve into life on an insect scale but the problem is that none of them really do justice to just how weird it is uh even the really dark ones like hollow knight don't really get into things like uh parasitism uh sexual cannibalism you know there's all kinds of uh interesting stuff that would make for uh just a really bizarre and fascinating role play experience but i think just because yeah as we said um most systems can't handle it, so no one's really, you know, attempted to do something like that before. Mm-hmm. Even on a video game, how would you handle combat where, you know, characters uh, can run across any surface? You know, they can run up trees, they can run upside down along the bottoms of branches and things like that. It, it would basically be too difficult to, to program effectively. I think the only thing that could really handle it is a very open-ended TRPG. Yeah. Hell, hell, most games that try and use a most games that try and use grid combat, you introduce flying into that, and they just die. Yeah. So you can, um, and when I think when I think about it, even though it would take some work, the only other there's only t- there's only two games there's only two um major game systems I can think of that could reasonably use this, and I say, and I and when I say reasonably, I'm putting in I'm putting in the air quotes with at least one of them because no matter what you do with this, yeah. you're gonna be doing you're gonna be putting in some work. Um, like I'd I'd argue even if you use something as simple as fate, you'd be putting in some work. Oh, for sure. Um, one of them is um fu- is feng shui, which I know sounds odd, but when you consider that feng shui is um. A very very simple um, 2D 2D6 yin yang system that relies more on a set of archetypes and a, and a lot of craziness when it comes to mobility. Anyways, mm. I could see I could see it working out. You just have to come up with a whole new chapter of sticks. And right. the uh, the of uh, the other one is the one that you use, um, Savage Worlds. Which yeah. Savage Worlds is already ingrained to be built for um, more pulp style play, anyways. So in this case, it seems it would appear to be a natural fit. I definitely don't want an attrition style combat system. Life is cheap if you're a bug. Uh, I I like the 
aspect of Savage Worlds where you can just get one shotted by a random grunt. Mm-hmm. There's always something around the next leaf that can just take you out. Uh, yeah, and there's a certain existential horror that comes with that. Uh, in the adventure that I've published, um, and not, not to get into spoilers too much or anything, but I mean, there's two complete settlements, possibly three if you fail your mission, that just get completely wiped out in the course of, you know, one 12 hour day. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's something the Savage Worlds can reflect quite well. Yeah. Now, when it com- when it comes to actually, actually, the more the more they think about that whole that whole notion of you are you are this ti- you are this tiny person in the, in a land full of giants. The only the only game and the only setting I can think of that's gotten close to that kind of notion. And I am once again I am very very much stretching this. Is Mouse Guard. Mm. Yeah. And I will admit, I will admit, some of that stretching is because there is still a part of me that is very, very salty that that really awesome looking film project is never going to see the light of day. But with Mouse Guard, obviously, you're dealing, even though it is kind of going with a medieval history ap- approach. I can't go with fantasy because there's not really much in the way of magic. But it, you are you are dealing with them in a in a forest where there's a whole lot of things a whole lot of things bigger than you, and have no problem trying to eat you. Right. Um. And that being said, the character types that you can play are uh, considerably less varied than what you see with uh, insects. Yeah. And speaking of speaking of that. Now you've get, now um you've set up six races, but from what you had told me, it seems that you're you're putting in the possibility for a uh, custom um, race creation. Because obviously you can't cover every single variant and sub variant of bug. No, but you can get a good percentage of them. Mm-hmm. So my jump start only has six. Uh, I basically just included the ones that the player characters. Uh, have but there's about 10 in the uh proper release which is hopefully coming out in the next year Mm -hmm. Uh, my character creation chapter is pretty much done and actually i have it pulled up right here how big is it it's 60 pages uh that covers most of the major archetypes that people have talked about and what i want to do or what i have done i guess is include rules to use uh, Savage Worlds mechanics to mm-hmm. modify those and turn it into basically anything you want. Yeah. Uh, I've had people uh, in my playtest groups and just on forums and stuff just throwing species at me, to, more or less just to see if there's anything that the system can't handle. And so far, every suggestion they've made, I've either done it or know how it could be done fairly easily. Mm-hmm. And in in fact, I distinctly recall bef- before we got started, you had um you had messaged me ask asking about some asking about something similar, um mm-hmm. because obviously you didn't want to get put on the spot, and the answer I gave you was the um damsel fly. I saw a bunch of those yesterday. Actually, I went on a uh, hike uh, into some marshes and. I was definitely looking at the insects. Let me tell you, I've learned more about bugs in the last year than I would have ever cared to know before now. <laughs> uh, but it's entirely for game research. All right, so uh, dragonflies and damselflies are effectively the same thing. I mean, there, there are some scientific differences. There's like how they hold their wings and, um, uh, you know, there's some minor size variations and things like that. But from a game standpoint, uh, effectively dragonflies and damselflies would have the same stats. All right, so... You didn't specify what type of damselfly, so I decided to just go with one that's maybe a little larger than normal, maybe closer to dragonfly size. Uh, There's actually one really big one in South America that's uh, about five inches long, which uh, is definitely going to be a major NPC later, Mm -hmm. uh, a villain, but uh, we we won't get into that. Okay, so regular dragonfly or damselfly. Uh, Let's see. Okay, so uh, you you played Savage Worlds a bit. All right, so uh, the... Character, or sorry, the racial values for stingers and spores, I'm doing plus four in racial bonuses. Uh, The reason I did that is because uh, plus two is standard, but I feel like that doesn't really give you enough room to capture the variability of insect, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, 
powers and traits and things like that. So plus four is what we're going with. All right. So for the dragonfly, they have uh, the arcane background gifted first off. Uh, so gifted is basically how they're doing superpowers in the, uh, the new. things start moving in kind of slow time so they're able to get out of the way and yeah dodge attacks mm -hmm. uh, of course when they level up they can also expand this to get other powers that uh, affect their speed and get them to go even faster mm -hmm. uh, they have bites uh, obviously they're carnivorous uh, they have a, uh, a hindrance called buzzer uh, basically it's very easy to notice them when they're in flight they kind of sound like a little helicopter when they're flying around so mm -hmm. you know insane. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a uh, character with that ability in one of my playtest groups, and he's basically anywhere he needs to be on the game map every turn. You know, he never, he, he uses uh, ranged attacks. He never fires at medium or long range. He's always able to you know, zip right up to where he needs to be, take a shot at close range, and get out before he uh, is in serious trouble. Alright, All right, so that's quite a lot of edges right there, so you need to balance it out with some hindrances okay so we had yeah. buzzer already the next one is hungry uh so hungry is a minor hindrance they have to eat twice as much as other insects of their size which wouldn't sound too bad on its own but the other hindrance they have is something called ravenous uh so ravenous insects are carnivorous and even though cannibalism is you know kind of frowned upon in civilized insect society if a dragonfly doesn't get enough to eat if they get two levels of fatigue from hunger they actually turn on their party and become a uh, an NPC until their hunger has been sated. Which, def which, um, well, you did you did build this as a dark fantasy, so that definitely counts. Uh, in in my um uh in my jump start, one of the pregens is a mantis, mm -hmm. uh, Acra, who also has the ravenous uh, hindrance, and in her backstory. When she was a starting adventurer, her uh, party was captured by an evil wizard. And when he knew, you know, how hungry she was, he basically starved her for a couple of days and then threw her into a um, uh, a cell with the rest of her adventure party bound and gagged. And then that's, you know, what happened to them. Mm -hmm. so it's definitely something that uh, GMs can use on players from time to time it's come up a couple of times in my play tests although no one's been cannibalized yet yeah. uh, let's see they have outsider uh, which kind of stacks with that if you're capable of you know getting too hungry and turning on everybody you're never going to be fully trusted and then the last thing they have is size plus two so uh you know savage worlds has uh kind of an interesting size scale humans are size zero and then it goes you know size minus whatever i think mm -hmm down to like minus six and up to pretty much indefinitely uh, because, you know, there's kaiju games and whatnot. Uh, so the scale I'm using, uh, honeybees are size zero because pretty much everybody across the world knows what a honeybee looks like and about how big they are. Uh, they're also kind of a medium-sized bug, so I just thought that was a good starting point. Uh, so dragonflies are size two, or uh, damselflies as well. Uh, at size two, they get, you know, the uh, the bonus to toughness, but they also have to pay double the cost for gear. So actually, that size modifier uh, doesn't cost any racial abilities because uh, you get a bonus and then you get a pretty steep penalty as well. So I consider that to be self-balancing. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to something that I find interesting is the mentioning of um, gear, which... Mm -hmm. While it certainly puts some mental images in my in my head, um, would that would get would gear um built be built around um, weapons and armor and the and the like, or would mo or would most people would most um characters in this be utilizing their uh, na their natural um setup? Well, it really depends on uh, what kind of bug you're going with. Uh, some things, mantises, for example, uh, if you have a mantis character, you could get a weapon if you want to, but do you really need one? 
Uh, dragonflies don't have a particularly powerful bite. Uh, yeah, it, it really depends on the species. And then uh, the uh, herbivorous species, if you want to play a stick bug, for example, stick bugs don't really have any natural uh, defense mechanisms. You know, their defense is the fact that you don't usually know that they're there. So, yeah, herbivorous bugs especially use weapons pretty regularly mm -hmm. uh they are in this setting uh, you know you see um games like hollow knight for example uh where characters have access to metal and you know actual technology mm -hmm. uh, in this setting i've kept it all organic so um like if you look at the artwork of the uh, jump start uh you see uh yellow jacket warriors buzzing around and they're wearing helmets but if you look closely what those helmets are is they're actually acorn caps which uh swords which... and I mean, it makes sense. It's about the right size. Mm -hmm. it's, the, you know, it's a good shape, uh, and it just has a nice aesthetic to it as well. Uh, yeah, so weapons are made out of uh, sticks and twigs and briars, especially. If, it, if it's sharp and pointy, uh, then they'll probably use it. Uh, mm -hmm. I have some other artwork that I've been uh, uh, playing around with on forums uh, where uh, there's a character that has a, a spear made from a, a scorpion tail. So yeah, that's the other thing, is if it's a natural weapon from a non-insect creature... Uh, it can also be utilized by the uh, the bugs. Uh, mm -hmm. Vertebrate bones are going to be, you know, kind of the legendary material of uh, the setting. And then, in, in that, I'm get I'm guessing that you're go that you're going with the is when it comes to it. Are you are you setting up a whole a whole new gear table for this, or are or are you playing equivalents? Uh, there are, definitely are some new bits of gear, uh, but a, a lot of them are more or less equivalents. Uh, you're you're going to have your standard, you know, bucklers, short sword, long sword. Sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But there is some new stuff as well. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is that uh, scale is a big factor. Uh, mm -hmm. Big bugs have to carry big weapons, and really strong bugs can also carry really big weapons. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the things that ants are known for, ants start with strength D8 instead of D4 because, you know, ants are really strong. Mm -hmm. uh, this means that your average ant warrior is going to be walking around with essentially the equivalent of like a buster sword. It's... Don't mess with ants. <laughs> that, um, that put, that puts, that's certainly an interesting image. Yep. Yeah, they got their spindly little arms, and then you know these giant weapons that they can wield with ease. Mm -hmm. Um. Now, something I did find interesting in the in the jumpstart is the inclusion of arcane backgrounds. Yes. And you can, you kind of tipped you kind of dipped into that a little bit when you brought up how how you do a, a damselfly earlier, but. What I'm curious about was was that was that just a means to make it so that um, there isn't a set rule ruling when it comes to using stingers and spores that it's just as much of a sandbox as any other Savage Worlds setting. Uh, well, uh, okay, so arcane background gifted specifically is basically my catch-all for if a bug has an ability that's too weird to really account for, then you can probably find some way to explain it. Uh, let's see, other bugs I've used with uh, Gifted. Uh, in the jump start, there's a uh, bombardier beetle. You know, they shoot caustic chemicals out their abdomens. And uh, yeah, so that's essentially the bolt power or blast or burst or whatever uh, you mm -hmm. want to use. Um, silkworms uh, can make web with their mouths. So that's, uh, yeah, just another you know, way to do bolt. Uh, let's see, fireflies might have like the light ability. which just pretty much spread out out of the ground and do attacks for. And then we have a, a mantis monk as well who uses chi and you know kind of falls into the, the kung fu tropes. Uh, we, we have some others as well. Uh, this one has significantly more arcane background types than Gods and Masters did. And mm -hmm. it's taken some work, but I think they all definitely uh, have their role in a, uh, a balanced party. Uh, the one that uh, I've had the most fun designing is uh, bards uh, or chirpers if, if you're a bug. Uh, it's pretty much the ultimate support role. Uh, you're going to be basically useless if you're in a fight by yourself, but 
you can just you know buff the hell out of everything uh and also uh debuff as well pretty much anybody who's in uh your uh range of uh singing it has you know, something to either uh fear or hope from you so it's the bard except it's actually useful yeah <laughs> um and what and um given the given so it's it sounds like you it sounds like you have a you have a you have a chi based background a arcane based background and a divine based background. Uh, there's more than that. Hold on, let me pull them up and we'll go through them. All right, so there's alchemy. Mm-hmm. So alchemy in this case would be mixing chemicals uh, that you might be able to find in the wild, pheromone sacks. Uh, you know, even things like honey could make a sticky bomb. Uh, yeah, so just yeah, stuff that you would find in the wild. Venoms, uh, yeah, there's a, a poison power that they have access to. Okay, the next one is chirping, which uh, allows uh, bards to, yeah, basically sing and become support classes. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, you are uniquely vulnerable as a bard. You can buff a significant number of your allies and debuff enemies at the same time. But if you are shaken uh, or, you know, wounded, uh, the power dissipates immediately so that's something that's been happening uh in play tests is the uh the, we, we have a chirper in our party and uh he'll you know get an early action and start you know raising vigor or fighting on everybody uh on uh the player character side and then all of the enemies when they see this it's just kill the bird and you know everyone starts going for him so uh yeah you're very useful but you've got to be able to take some punishment it's not it uh, gifted like- yeah we've already talked it's it sounds like the it sounds like um, Stingers and Spores has their own version of Geek the Mage first. Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, although I would say the the Bard is probably more important to uh, kill than even the Mage is. All right, so we have Gifted, which we've already talked about. Mm-hmm. We do have proper magic. Uh, yeah, so in the Jumpstart, there's a wizard who uses uh, spider webs. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the the straight up magical abilities uh, currently, uh, and again, you know, this isn't finished so there could be more but currently we have uh silk spinners who manipulate spider webs we have uh slime molders who use slime and then we have rotters who use uh the power of decomposition mm-hmm. I, I tried to you know make all the magic things that would be comprehensible to bugs uh, like for example they don't have fire fire is not something that you know most insects would have ever experienced and it's certainly not something that they can harness if there is a forest fire, that's like an apocalyptic event. Uh, let's see. The next one is Miracles. Uh, miracles has, uh, I believe, five gods and a bunch of uh, smaller demigods that you can choose as patrons, but that's neither here nor there. Okay, so we have uh, Fungus, which we've already talked about. Yeah, the Veiled One, the Fungus God. We have the Plant Goddess, uh, who uses, you know, thorns. goddess uh which has a very handy ability called buzzkill which just knocks a flying character right out of the sky if they get hit with a uh, wind power mm-hmm. it's very handy if you have characters without the flight ability and then the last one is um did i say water yeah the water goddess yep. so that's what i think the elements would be mm-hmm. if you were a bug size most of them probably don't you know have any experience with uh fire or uh you know, lightning or any of that sort of thing. But fungus and plant life, they understand. Uh, and then the last one is, uh, yeah, your uh, kung fu-based uh, yeah, monk magic. Mm-hmm. And what I, do find, what I do find interesting is that when describing the pregens, you <laughs> describe them in, in roles that one would expect to see in a, um, in a traditional fantasy game. Um, you know, bar- a barbarian, the uh, bug at arms, I'd I'd say is probably your, is probably your your uh, spin on the fighter, a cleric, a monk, a ranger, and a uh, wizard. And what when I think of when I think of the of something that would be considered a man at arms or a bug at arms in this case, I'm thinking of a um a character archetype that ha- that is good with weapons and tends to carry a variety of them on their person with. That be fairly accurate for that pregen. Uh, Bordis is 
basically a knight. Uh, so he carries heavy armor. Uh, he has a pretty good sized shield and he has a sword. Uh, it's leveled up a little bit, but I didn't put too many level ups into my pre gens just because I wanted to, you know, create characters at the start of their adventure, not at the end. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, a proper, you know, master of arms would have, yeah, spears, uh, axes, you know, swords, rapiers, a variety of things that they could use depending on the situation. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that is one thing to mention is that encumbrance isn't really an issue with insects. Uh, You know, ants are famous for being strong, but the truth is that most insects are actually pretty strong for their size. Uh, And, you know, if we we were shrunk down to bug size, we would have to worry about encumbrance a lot more than they do. So as long as it doesn't get completely ridiculous, I'm pretty happy to hand wave it for this setting. So, yeah, carrying you know, five or six different weapons uh, in your backpack is totally a thing that they can do. Yeah. Now, when it comes now, um, when, and for what it's for what it's worth, I um, I'm very loose with encumbrance, anyways, unless I'm playing something um very. You really like, should very be item he- very item heavy. Like, if I was playing a survival centric game, like say um Year Zero, I'd be a li- I'd be a little bit more anal about about uh, encumbrance. It, it's really a, a genre trope. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, survival games, uh, horror games, yeah, encumbrance, or uh, yeah, post-apocalyptic stuff. Yeah, encumbrance is definitely a thing. Mm-hmm. But with just kind of ca- casual adventuring, uh, for lack of a better word, no, you, you really shouldn't worry about it. Yeah. Uh, I'm pretty fast and loose with ammo for the same reason. Um, personally, the approach I've taken with ammo is that ammo is unlimited, but reloading isn't. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. I I you still have once you're once you're out of ammo you still have you still have to um spend that action to re, to um reload the thing and depending on how forgiving it is sometimes I'll have that be a roll because I like the whole I like the whole active reload thing from Gears of War. Yep. So if you roll well, then it then then the then um it doesn't count as an action. If you roll poorly, hmm. then it counts as a full round action. <clears throat> And if and if you roll really poorly, if you're just using old school guns, then you drop got, the magazine. You got to wait multiple. You got to wait multiple ones, or you've got a case of a jam, and that means you got to spend more time dealing with it. Yep. Um, yeah, that makes sense. So I did that a lot with a um, with when I, when I was doing a um, chi- when I was doing a, a Chicago typewriter kind of campaign, and well, Tommy Gun- Tommy, oh, Tommy guns Tommy were Gun- known Tommy for Gun- jamming Gun- a lot. Yeah, yeah, they're they're not actually a very efficient gun by modern standards. They're also very heavy. The reason I don't know if you've ever shot one, one, but yeah, they weigh a, a ton. The reason why they be, they were so, they were so um, emblematic of the time is because they were cheap. Hmm. One of the rules of combat is your weapon is made by the lowest bidder. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, now when it now um. When it comes to the barbarian in that in that case, is it a barbarian in the traditional sense? You know, big weapon, not issuing armor, and knows and likes to rage. I didn't give her heavy armor. I mean, she did. I, I believe she's wearing like uh, mushroom leather or something well, like I that. I said. Uh, shoe, I, gave I, her said a big I said a shoes armor. So they don't. Uh, well, they don't go with armor. Uh, you don't have to. Uh, that that's more of a trope of like uh, you know Conan the Barbarian that that, that sort of thing uh, to not wear armor at all. Uh, now that being said, um, a barbarian, the way I see it, really should uh, you know focus more on damage dealing than being able to take hits. Uh, uh, our, our barbarian in the uh, the jump start is Hilda the uh, the Hornet. She's not incapable of getting hit, but uh, damage per second is really where her true strength lies. I gave her, I believe, a really big club, and she does have the berserk. In. Yeah. Um, now, you know, that's one of... thing about Savage Worlds being a. Um, Go ahead. With a lot, with a lot of insects, you kind of have these radical transformations that they go through throughout their uh, life cycle. And yes, I've accounted for that. Some, yes, yeah, that's something you accounted for, and how. Okay, so, uh, well, it, basically, uh, I'm, I'm simplifying here, but essentially there are 
two ways that bugs can mature. Uh, the first one is uh, they can they start out as nymphs. Uh, mantises would be a good example of that. So uh, if you look at a baby mantis uh, when they pop out of the uh, the egg sac, they basically look like just a smaller version of the adult. Uh, they have softer bodies. Uh, they're not capable of flight yet, and they uh, they molt a lot. Mm-hmm. All right, so. Depending on the species, you could get that hindrance. Okay, it's called the nymph hindrance. Uh, don't have it pulled up right in front of me, but basically, uh, you—it's kind of like the um, the young hindrance from Savage Worlds, and then some. Mm-hmm. So you start out with reduced skill points. Uh, you have a penalty to toughness. You're smaller, and if your species has a flight ability, you don't have it yet. Uh, the upside is you have a regenerative ability because you're molting frequently. Uh, so that's the kind of light way to do it. The other one is larva. Larva is an entirely different racial archetype. So you start out as a grub of some sort. It could be a caterpillar. It could be, you know, a beetle grub. You could even be an antlion if you know what that is. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you're you're slow. You're pudgy. You have to eat a lot. Uh, you're completely incapable of flight. Uh, yeah, you have a big appetite. I think I already said that. Uh, but then, uh, and some of them actually start with, you know, unique uh, abilities of their own. Like silkworms have uh, gifted, arcane background gifted, uh, and it allows them to uh, shoot silk webs. Uh, antlions, uh, which turn into, you know, a type of fly, uh, start out as these big bulky things with powerful jaws that are capable of digging traps. Uh, sort of like a, a trapdoor spider. So they have you know, the bite attack, and then they also have arcane background gifted, which allows them to, uh, you know, ensnare. Uh, but then when they get to veteran, or later, if the GM decides it's appropriate, they pupate. They go into a cocoon or a chrysalis or what have you for about a week, mm-hmm. and then they come out as a completely different character archetype. And at that point, the player gets to take any physical edges uh, or skills or attributes even, anything that's like agility or Mm strength-based, and completely respec their character into a different type. So that's how you have antlions, which turn into, um, yeah, a type of fly. Uh, You know, silkworms turn into uh, a moth. Uh, Mm -hmm. Beetle grubs, you know, turn into a beetle. So you start out at a pretty significant disadvantage, although you can have some weird powers of your own, but then... You know how kind of in the same way that when you build a character at level one and then you play them to a high level, it's very different than if you just build a character at a high level. Which that um, that definitely make that definitely makes sense. Um, That's kind of the opportunity you get. Yeah, and I like that you have a simple way to do it and a crunchy way to do it because. Um, Sim- simple is not al- simple is not always better, and crunch is not the devil that certain pe- that certain people like to think it is. Yeah, I definitely wouldn't recommend playing a larva for everybody. But if you have your heart set on a you know particular character archetype, if you just really want to play a caterpillar, we can make that happen. Yeah. Now, when it com- now when it com- when it comes to um. When it comes to th- when it comes to threats that one could f- that one could find in stingers and spores, I do remember mm-hmm. you mentioning to me that you had spiders strictly as a antagonist type. Well, and... the conceit of the first book, at least, is that uh, you're playing heroic characters. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't think I want to open up gameplay to evil characters just yet. Although we'll see, you know, depending on how this is received. Yeah. I could definitely see allowing spiders as uh, an evil race, as it were. Uh, but not all spiders are sentient either. Uh, the, the spiders uh, come in different categories. I've basically divided them up into uh, jumping spiders, uh, which are, you know, they, they jump, they're fast, they're small. They're effectively the wolves of the, uh, the insect kingdoms. Uh, you know, if you're roaming around in the forest by yourself at night, there's a good chance that you could get jumped by one. But if you're hanging out in a well-armed party, you know, at a campsite, your, your chances of being attacked are quite small. Uh, then we have the, uh, the bigger ones, uh, like the ground spiders. Uh, you know, that would be like huntsmen. You know what those are? 
Mm-hmm. Uh, I saw one of those in my apartment the other day. It was uh, about the size of a half dollar, and it was skittering pretty fast. They're, they're, they're freaky. Uh, yeah, so you have those. You know, they get really big in Australia. Uh, tarantulas, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, those, especially when they start to get really big, are basically a breed of kaiju. Mm-hmm. They're stupid. Uh, they're big. They do a lot of damage. You know, a tarantula could wreck a settlement if they wanted to. There's actually one kind of tarantula I was reading about that uh, sprays venom onto its prey and basically starts like dissolving them right there. That's basically a kaiju breath weapon. Yeah. Which, given that, where where would you put where would you put say a trapdoor spider? Trapdoor spider. Uh, I would make that uh, one of the I think I would probably make that one of the sentient spider types. Uh, most of the web spiders, I say, are sentient. Like, the orb weavers are bad news. They're, they're effectively the uh, the demons of the insect kingdom. Uh, but one, one of the, the lore things is that uh, silk spinning as a magical art form, uh, there's a story that it originally came from the spiders. Uh, supposedly, there were uh, some butterfly two butterfly brothers who are trying to discover like the secrets of spider magic. Mm -hmm. Uh, One of them was approached by a spider who said, you know, I'll give you anything you want to know. All you have to do is, uh, you know, arrange for your brother to find his way into my web. And then when that happened, the gods were so upset that this other butterfly was cursed uh, and disfigured. And that's where moths come from. Uh, Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, Spiders definitely have that role is yeah, sort of this demonic influence. They offer great power, but they're also very dangerous yeah. uh, in a similar way that in many uh, fantasy games, you can make deals with, you know, devils uh, to mm-hmm. get more magical power. You can do that with spiders. Yeah. Uh, if you're willing to, you know, feed a spider with somebody, uh, they can help you out. In that regard, what would be the what would be the insect kingdom equivalent to dragons for something like stingers and spores? Oh goodness! Uh, oh, so frogs first off. I could I could definitely see that a, even a small frog would certainly be terrifying, especially since they can leap like hell too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, from a. Uh... They can effectively, at, at least in between combats, they can basically teleport. Because uh, you ever seen like a, a leopard frog or a pickerel frog jump? They can go, you know, several yards. So uh, there can be, you, you can be hanging out in a settlement and all of a sudden, bam, there's a frog right there. Uh, birds are kind of the same thing. Uh, so even little things like, uh, you know, sparrows are pretty scary if you're half an inch tall. Uh, in the jump start, I have a, a coat of arms for uh, one of the uh, NPCs, uh, and it has a, a picture of a finch on it. Mm-hmm. And uh, the, yeah, the story is that one of her ancestors fought and slayed this terrible finch that was, you know, harassing their castle, and so that's why they uh, adopted as their arms. And of course, that's not even getting into the big stuff. Like, what kind of havoc could a uh, an armadillo or an ant eater wreck on a, uh, you know, an ant hill or a termite mound? Oh. That's that's basically we're we're getting into like Tarask territory. Yeah, <laughs> when the that's the GM's version of saying "fuck you." Yeah. Um. And since the whole coat of arms thing was mentioned, I'm guessing that you have plan that you have um plans on put on putting in at least at least at, at a later date means so that people could come up with their come up with their own um similar coat of arms like sto- like tales. Uh, I'm definitely going to to mention it. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't want to fall into you know strict rules of heraldry or anything like that. And the other other thing to consider is that, okay, imagine. I mean, the world's a pretty big place now. Mm-hmm. If you don't have you know uh, mechanical conveyance, if if you're you know walking everywhere, the world is gigantic. How much bigger is the world if you're a bug? How many empire? If, if an empire could be the size of a city park, how many empires are there in the world? That's a, that is a fair point, and when it comes to that sort of thing, I always remember watching Honey, I Shrunk the Kids as well, a little kid. Yeah. So heraldry could have all kinds of different rules depending on where you are. Yeah. You know, there might be regional customs that apply one place that don't apply 
somewhere else. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to keep it fairly open-ended for that. Uh, you might also, if you want to, uh, I'm, I'm talking about this with uh, some of the other writers I have on board. Uh, so, you know, n no promises yet. But the other thing you can do is you can even explore different fantasy genres, depending on where you want to go. You know, if you want to um, you know, go away from the medieval European kind of setting and you want to have, you know, like a, a kung fu story that takes place in like, you know, the bug version of ancient China or Japan, you go for it. Mm hmm. Insect world is a big place. There's bound to be, you know, oh, you could, some you, society where that's the thing. Given how beetle wrestling was a th was a thing in J was, has been a thing in Japan for for a long time, you could easily make a campaign just out of that. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned that. Uh, since I've been yeah researching bugs and everything, uh, it's a pretty big thing in Taiwan as well. I actually have two pet beetles now. This has become a lifestyle. Yeah, bug trivia has, since I started writing this, become like 30% of my personality. <laughs> I'm sad to say. Um, you don't sound all that sad. No. No, I, I suppose I'm not. <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, that's totally a thing. Uh, tournament. Uh, that, that's a great idea for a tournament. You just have a tree. You know, a beetle maiden at the top of the tree, and as you climb up the branches, you have to fight other beetles, and whoever loses gets yeeted off the side of the tree. Yeah. Oh. And what? So, given that, given that, I'm guessing, I'm guessing that one of the one, that um one of the assumptions I could see ha I could see happening when somebody first approaches this, and maybe you had this issue during with uh, playtesters, is pe is people having the assumption that they, that you're going straight up. You're playing it. You're playing as but you're playing as bugs with no monkey wrench thrown in it, as in as if you're playing in um, as simulationist as possible. Well, uh, I actually had a hard time selling this game concept on my regular game group when I first said, you know, uh, we're gonna do a bug RPG. Every single one of them was just like, no, we're not doing that. Uh, that's actually the reason that I start with. Uh, established fantasy archetypes you know i have the uh, the ranger or the, the monk the uh, uh you know the barbarian that sort of thing is because it ties it to something that's more accessible yeah and yeah, I've, I've definitely had people raise that concern yeah and i'm i'm guess even though even though in both of these cases it uses mice i'm guessing that when it comes to suggested reading you'd probably also put or suggested reading or watching, you'd probably also put in stuff like um, the Secret of Nim, or even, and this is def this is definitely stretching the concept, but nine. Yeah, it couldn't hurt. And as I had also, I would be willing to throw Small Saga in that, but that game's not out yet, so I can't. I was gonna say I'm not familiar with that one. Um, it was funded on Kickstarter a while back. It's still in development, but there is a demo out for it. Um, it had some, it had some interesting approaches like a, like a pyromancer whose, who, whose flame is basically him holding around a lighter. <laughs> um, nice. Oh yeah, I see it now. It's kind of a turn-based, uh, like almost fantasy, very sorry, Final Fantasy style combat system. The, the, uh, combat system reminded me of, if anything, of Golden Sun. Okay. Um. All right, yeah, I see a mouse holding a gigantic Swiss Army knife bigger than he is. Yeah, all right. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, yeah, okay. Yeah, it's 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 similar. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll give you that. Uh, again, uh, you're going to see much more um, uh, character diversity with bugs than you are with rodents. But yeah, same kind of thing. Yeah, the reason that's the reason why I br why I brought up these two these um, examples in particular because it's a case of showing. The, showing what would seem like a normal world to to us from the perspective of, of the sm of the smallest kind of people. Yep. Um, uh, in the stuff that I'm going to be releasing, I don't really deal with humans at all. That's kind of an artistic choice as much as anything. I want to play up the horror elements and keep it from getting too silly. But I do include uh, in the setting rule chapter, which is done, uh, rules for turning it into more of a you know, Saturday morning cartoon, uh, you know, fantasy in the backyard sort of thing. Yeah. If you want to do that. 
I think I think what's what's going to help what's going to help something like this the most is demonstrating the ver demonstrating the variety of what you can do with this approach. Yep. And it's not it's not like there it's not like there haven't been insect or insect le insect like um races in fantasy. Um if you recall there was the Thrike the um Thrikeen in um Dark Sun. Yep. Which But they're still on a macro scale. Yeah. I'm just I'm just saying that's the there's certainly been so, there's certainly been teasings of this sort of idea over the years, but nobody's ever gone full in in the pool. And that's why I, th I I get the feeling that the GM chapter for this is going to be a bit more extensive than um, GM chapters in other books. Not the saying you skip it's, on GM. It's gonna chapters, have to be. It's just, it is what it is. And yep. I'm ge I'm also guessing. Would also be fair of me to say that there's go that within the full size book, there's going to be some, um, some example setups that are out that are outside of the, um, outside of the high fantasy trappings, you know, just to show what oh, sure. other things you can do with it, because that's what I'm focusing oh, on naturally. that line. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um. And even and with all with all that, how um. Now the now, it's a decent it's a decent page count when it comes to the leaping jaws. It's only thirty two pages. Um, how large do you foresee the um? F do you see the full size book being? Do you see it to be about the same size as Gods and Masters, or do you think it's going to be bigger? Well, Gods and Masters was huge uh, for a few reasons. Uh, uh, for one thing, um, you know, I had three different factions that I had to explain in detail. I had minimum two chapters per faction uh, for Gods and Masters. So it was like um, you know, the lore, character creation, setting rules, magic, and then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven faction chapters. And then after all that, oh, and uh, um, did I mention um, the Gazetteer as well? Mm -hmm. So yeah, the uh, the player's guide itself was like ten chapters, whereas this one is going to be five. Uh, but that being said, these chapters are going to be a bit larger in uh, some ways, at least. The character creation, as I said, is pushing sixty already, and there's still some stuff I want to add to it. Yep. Uh, so I, I'm going to say it's probably going to be a little smaller than Gods and Masters, but Gods and Masters was a very big. Uh, it also had. Ten Savage Tales, if I recall correctly. Yes. I'm probably not going to put Savage Tales in the uh, the main supplement. Uh, well, one thing I've learned, you know, uh, Gods and Masters was my first Kickstarter. One thing I've learned since then is uh, that people are much more receptive to doing like a series of small books than having one giant tome as the end result. Oh, yeah. What I'll probably do is uh, Player's Guide... Uh, GM Guide would be an add-on if it gets funded. Uh, although the game will be perfectly playable just as a player's guide. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, some uh, Savage Tales in addition to that. And some Savage Tales are already coming out. Uh, a friend of mine is working on one uh, involving bug pirates right now. Mm -hmm. uh, as a matter of fact, the writing's done. We're just waiting on some of the artwork for it. Uh, so there will be some other smaller releases before the main uh, supplement comes out as well. Oh, all right. And uh, what um, are you going to are you going to be releasing that straight away? Or are you going to have that um, kickstarted? I'm going to have to do it kickstarted. Uh, I, I'm a small company. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's just the reality of the market we're in now. Uh, yeah. But that being said, uh, I don't take things to Kickstarter until they're ready. Uh, you know, everyone's heard horror stories of uh, you know these uh, game creators who get the money and then you know pushing three or four years later, uh, it still has yet to come out. Uh, okay, at the very least, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not, I'm not saying names or anything, but I think we, <laughs> we all know at least a few people that have done that. Uh, at the very least, I don't kickstart things till they're written. Mm -hmm. uh, I want it so that all the major work on my part has been done already. Now I'll definitely kickstart while I'm still waiting for art to come in. 
but that's one of those situations where you know if an artist drops the ball or falls off the face of the earth or what have you i can always find someone else uh whereas if a kickstarter is waiting on me that that's something that i don't want to happen mm-hmm. and would you would you say that you're that you'd probably try you'd probably try and shoot for this fall as a as a launch window for it or are you thinking that it you're thinking that it'd be earlier or later I'm hoping for fall uh, but you know I'm I'm somewhat realistic as well I think spring this time next year will be very very doable and I'm hoping to have it out before then but again, no promises. Uh, the player's guide is one half of a chapter from being complete. Uh, after that, really all I need to work on is the uh, GM section and bestiary, but the bestiary is going to be massive. There's so much weird stuff that I want to you know, account for. Uh, everyone's listing you know, new things that I, I should include. We have scorpions, vinegaroons, uh, centipedes are horrifying uh, <laughs> if you're an insect. Uh, and then, of course, the, uh, the vertebrate list. Uh, centipedes, uh, I, I heard this from somewhere, uh, and I definitely agree with it, is that you know, uh, frogs scare. Frogs would be scary if you were insect size, but centipedes are actually scary at human size. Mm-hmm. Um. Uh, yeah, so we're going to have all kinds of, uh, you know, horrible stuff like that. Uh, NPCs as well. Uh, I've, yeah, made out a list of, that's not, you know, I haven't filled them all out yet, but I've made out a list of all the NPCs that I want. And just because of the weirdness of the insect kingdoms, it's going to have a bit more than your regular fantasy uh, games might have. Uh, you know, there, there are strange roles that you wouldn't see in a regular game. Uh, mounts. Mounts aren't really a thing, uh, or at least not beast mounts. You know, you don't have the equivalent of horses. What you have is you have other bugs who are willing to taxi you around. Yep, yep all good. So, so now even even with that, when it comes to, when it comes to um, you meant now you mentioned beast you mentioned beast here, and yeah, I can see that being massive and. Given the fact that the bo- that the book itself uh, that the um, jumpstart has um, has a few wild cards that it's adding, I'm guessing that you'll have a section for um, for potential wild cards with their own story seeds. Uh, that is uh, something I'm considering. Uh, if anything, I think that'll probably be a stretch goal. Uh, there's definitely going to be a huge list of stock NPCs, uh, and what all you would really need to do is take that and add it to a racial archetype. I have a bunch of those as well. Uh, I forget the exact number, but uh, last I counted, it was pushing 25 or 30. Mm -hmm. So you're going to have a lot of variety uh, of characters right outside the box. And, uh, you know, if you want to make your own races, you obviously can do a lot further than that. Uh, One of the other things that I would uh, like to uh, include in the GM section is basically kind of a thought process if you really want to you could take kind of stock you know fantasy even D D adventures and you could very easily make them bug adventures with a little bit of modification you know change that uh dragon into a frog or a bird or you know change this castle into a uh, you know a tree stump that sort of thing all right that makes sense that makes sense yeah um uh- Either way, I'm I'm definitely gonna be looking forward to seeing how it how it turns out. And yes, that whole that whole um bug wrestling thing is stu- is stuck in my head because there's some ridiculous ways that we can take it. Um, if you want to go really far with it, have um have a pro wrestling campaign just using beetles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's very doable. Um, but with that, with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come to come onto the show to talk about this project. Um, Pleasure being here, and 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 a pl- and I appreciate you braving the hell of time zones in order to do it. And I can say, come up to the temple because, well, it's really cold up here. <laughs> um, yeah. And and of course, anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. 
as I often say, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. I'll keep that in mind. I appreciate it. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!